for me and for me. And Welcome back to Welcome three, back to uh, three. Uh, I I no, mine has stopped. I think. All right. Sorry about that. Great. So this welcome to this workshop session. So just from a technical standpoint, we're going to have two workshops in this Zoom session. So you don't need to log out or do anything. Uh, and so without further ado, let me pass it over to Rick Shomsky, workshop, workshop coordinator. Well, thank you, Dave. And this is the first of 10 workshops in this convention two right in a row, as Dave has mentioned. And the first workshop is called The Beginner's Guide to Stereo Photo Maker. And it's being presented by David Starkman. And David, along with his partner, Susan Pinsky, ran three real 3D enterprises selling 3D supply to 3D photographers and enthusiasts from 1978 to 2005. He's a past president of the Stereo Club of Southern California, which is now the LA 3D Club and has been a member of that club since 1977. He's a contributing editor to the National Stereoscopic Association's Stereo World Magazine, and is currently doing what he can to help Susan with her 3D Legends website. Everybody. Welcome, I'm David Starkman, and I'm giving a workshop today that is a beginner's guide to Stereo Photo Maker. So if you're already familiar with it, uh, this isn't necessarily for you. This is for those people that have never tried it before or maybe have and just couldn't figure it out. So a little more about me, uh, I'm a past president of the LA 3D Club. Uh, I've been uh, writing for Stereo World Magazine for over 30 years. I'm a contributing editor. And uh, my wife and I used to publish a newsletter called Real 3D News. And for over 25 years, we had a company, Real 3D Enterprises, that sold products for people who were doing 3D photography. And I've been doing digital 3D since about 2005. So without further ado, uh, let's have a look at Stereo Photo Maker. So what is Stereo Photo Maker? Uh, it's a free program created by a Japanese man named Masuji Sudo uh, that he has made available free to all of us who want to use it. And it is a program, think of it as kind of like Photoshop for 3D or a Swiss Army knife for 3D uh, for everything you would want to do to uh, a 3D pair, which is a right and a left picture uh, to get it aligned for proper viewing. Uh, that's what Stereo Photo Maker will do for you, and it makes it very easy to do. Uh, as you hopefully already know, uh, every stereo image, whether it's digital or film, uh, consists of two pictures, a right and a left, uh, whether you've taken it with a cell phone, left, right, two cameras, maybe coupled together, or with two finger sync, or maybe they're synced some other way. These days, the easiest way I'd tell you all to get started is with a Fuji 3D camera, which is a digital camera that has two lenses. And that's the easiest way to get going. And uh, also you can do it with a single camera, just like you can with a phone. And there are things like called slide bars. This is a simple one where you take a, a left and a right picture and this slides over about two and a half inches. And one way or another, you've got two images, a right and a left. And uh, those have to be aligned for viewing. You know, you then, like from a hundred years ago, that consists of a left and a right eye picture. Or there's a modern stereo, same thing, full color, but it's a left and a right. Principles have not changed. 
And you can do that easily with your cell phone, taking a left and a right. Now, when you do that, uh, you might accidentally tilt your camera just a little bit when you take the left or right picture, you know, between the two pictures. If you're not perfectly level, uh, that could happen. Or one might be a little higher or lower in your composition. Well, Stereo Photo Maker can automatically correct those problems. And that's why it is just a fantastic and wonderful program. So without further ado, let's have a look at what Stereo Photo Maker looks like. The easiest way to find it is if you go to your browser, here I'm in Google Chrome, and if you just type in Stereo Photo Maker, and in this case I've done it so many times, it's Stereo Photo one word, Maker's the second, and that'll take you to their homepage. And this is what it looks like. Uh, this is where the download is. There's a 64-bit, 32-bit. And by the way, this is a uh, PC-only program. For those of you using Mac, uh, I don't use a Mac myself. Uh, I, I'm told there uh, you can uh, use it using uh, Windows emulators. Uh, and that's not the cut topic that I will be covering. <laughs> but uh, it's, it is possible. Also, you'll notice on this site, there are already some beginner's guides that you can print out later on. And uh, uh, I think the best one is this one here, if you can see my cursor called an illustrated beginner's guide, which takes you through it step by step. Uh, there's a little more elaborate verbal one, this one here, which I've written called the SPM Illustrated Fuji W1 or if you're using twin camera or uh, shifting a single camera, just the SPM beginner's guide. Uh, so that's how you can find Stereo Photo Maker. So once you've downloaded it, and it's a very small, again, free program. Okay, so once you've downloaded Stereo Photo Maker, uh, I've then uh, uh, dragged it onto my desktop, and this is what it looks like. It says 3D Pro, and I've renamed it with the current version, SPM 6.15. And you double click on that. And uh, this is what maybe scares a few beginners is you get this black screen with uh, not too much of a hint what to do. Well, uh, it's, it's really pretty easy. And I'll use the, uh, the verbal versions of what to do. Uh, as are on most Windows programs. You know, you've got file edit, et cetera. I'll say before you even start, the first thing I do, the first time you download it, I go to edit and go to preferences. And the main thing that's not checked is this here where it says start up with window maximized. Uh, I'd like to have that one checked uh, instead of having to open it up to full screen every single time. Uh, and these others are sort of optional, you, you choose. And for adjustment, I'll just leave everything with the defaults. As a beginner, that's all you need to do. So you go to the, back to the top where it says file open. And again, assuming you've used your cell phone or a single camera to take a left and a right picture, you go down to where here it says open left, right images. So you click on that. And at the top, you see it says open left image. And in this window, uh, first time, I'm not sure what it's going to show you, but it always shows you, it takes you to the last place that you were the last time you used Stereo Photo Maker. In this case, that's where it took me to. That's not where I want to be. So I can go over here up one level. And in this case, uh, well, if I went all the way, I've got uh, my pictures folder on this computer. And in the pictures folder, I've got a uh, NSA workshop. So I'm gonna go there. And in it, I already have a bunch of left and right images. Uh, and this is a bit of a housekeeping feature. Uh, before you do anything with those left and right images, I suggest you create a, fol a folder with at least uh, three folders in it one for the left, left eye images, one for the right eye images, and a third one to put the, your aligned images later on. I called it aligned pairs. 
So I'm going to go to the folder with my left images. And in this case, I've got four. Uh, I already have named them. Uh, that's a whole nother subject, but, uh, you know, we'll just keep it simple for today for beginners. So I'm in my left folder and I'm going to pick, uh, let's say the first left image. And if you click on it and click on open, and then you notice at the top, now it says open right image, but I'm still at the left folder. So again, I'm going to move over to this icon, which says move up one level. And now I can look at the folders I have and find my right folder. And I'm going to find the matching image. So here's the matching right image and uh, click on open. And there you go. Uh, I've got my left and right pair. And that's me holding an iPhone. And just to give you an idea, uh, so the default is a side-by-side -side parallel pair. But across the top here now, once you've opened an image, you've got a lot more icons here. And over here, you've got, if you hold your cursor over it, it'll tell you what it is. Uh, and this says side by side. That's what we're looking at. But the other options, there's a color anaglyph or a black, a gray anaglyph. And within those, next to the color anaglyph, there's a pop down that says uh, full color, half color, but it's red cyan. And since uh, you'll notice the 3D glasses you got, if you got the NSA uh, kit, are red and cyan, and those are the most popular colors because they work best with full color anaglyphs. Uh, I always leave this set to uh, color red cyan, and if it ghosts a lot, you can move it to half color, or sometimes people like prefer the black and white. But now that we're looking at it in anaglyph, notice how far apart the images are. These are going to be very hard to view. It's going to ghost like crazy. So I'm gonna, and so side by side, even though you might be able to view it with a viewer or free viewing, uh, the images are not well aligned because uh, it was just a bit close when it was taken. So here's the most beautiful feature for beginners of Stereo Photo Maker. It has a feature called auto alignment. And you can get to auto alignment either over here with this icon that says auto alignment or under adjust, if you prefer seeing things in writing, where it says adjust, down here, if you go down right here where it says auto alignment, or if you're one of those people that prefer shortcuts, it's the alt key plus the letter A. So I'm just going to use the pop down auto alignment. And when you click on that, Here's what happens. Notice in the lower uh, left of the screen, a little thermometer sideways is moving along and it's telling you that it's adjusting things. And what it's doing, it's comparing the left and right images to each other and matching them and aligning them up to each other. And then this box here tells you what it just did. If there was any rotation, let's say you had twisted the camera a little bit well, it just corrected the left and right images by minus 0.2 degrees and plus 0.2 degrees. There was a tiny, tiny bit of size difference, 0.1%. It just matched the sizes of the two images. Uh, it corrected a tiny amount of vertical, vertical perspective, a bit of horizontal perspective. And it moved a position vertically two pixels. One image was a little bit higher than the other. And horizontally, it moved it 123 pixels. I'm going to close that. And now, if we were to go back and view this in anaglyph, it's better. Sadly, it's not perfect. Uh, and unfortunately, auto alignment doesn't always get as far as it should. It's better than it was, but in this case, I'm gonna show you quickly, you can do a final tweak in what's called easy adjustment. And again, since for beginners, you might prefer words. If you go to adjust on the toolbar up here and go to easy adjustment, 
you can see your anaglyph. And if you click up here, you can maximize it to see it full screen. And notice there's a horizontal position slider here. And you can click and drag that. I'm not going to touch verticals because auto alignment already did that perfectly. And now, if you were to look at this in anaglyph, you'll see it's way easier to view. And if I go back to the color anaglyph screen, there it is. And there it is side by side. Uh, let's try one more where maybe it'll be a little more obvious. Open a left and right, another left and right image. So go open left, right image. And this time I'm going to pick this group shot. And there's the left. And because I've done this before, it's automatically finding the matching right because I just did a left and right using those same folders. But let's say it didn't know that. I'll do it manually. It says open right image, so I have to go back up one level, find the right folder, find the matching right image, open that. So there's another picture taken with two cameras, or it could have been taken with a single camera as long as nobody moved. And if I look at this in anaglyph mode, notice how far apart these images are in anaglyph. Well, let's go back to side by side and let's uh, go to the auto adjustment. Oh, sorry, that's auto, auto alignment. I'm sorry, auto alignment and see what happens. So again, it, it's you notice in the lower left, it's showing you progress uh, bar. And again, the faster your computer is, the faster it does this. But there, it's almost done. Now it's just finished. And again, it shows you uh, the amount of rotation that it's corrected, a uh, little more size difference in this pair. Uh, and it was vertically, it, it corrected it by five pixel height difference and moved it 143 pixels horizontally. So let's see how that looks now as an anaglyph. Uh, that's much, much better aligned than it was before, as you can see. And for most, uh, pictures, that will be good enough for beginners. And again, once you've got your pair, you can save it. And this gives you a lot of choices. Uh, depends how you want to save it. My normal default is as a side-by-side -side JPEG. So right now we're looking at a parallel side-by-side -side image. And if I was to click here on File, Save Stereo Image, uh, this box comes up. And down here, it shows you an image preview. And this is a tiny preview of what it's saving. So it's showing you that side-by-side -side pair. And up here, it's showing you where it's going to save it. Uh, that's not where I want to save it. Again, that was the last file I saved something in. So I'm going to move up a level. I'm going to find uh, my align pair folder. And, I'm, and here you can change the name if you wanted to. I'm going to open that. And this is, I'm going to save it there. Let's say I also wanted to save an anaglyph version of this. If I go to the anaglyph, I can again choose either a color anaglyph or a black and white anaglyph. Let's say I wanted to save the color anaglyph. Uh, it's going to save it in whatever format you're looking at. So again, if I go File, uh, Save Stereo Image, now you'll notice that the preview is not showing a side-by-side. -side, it's showing the anaglyph. And I don't want to save it in the Align Pair folder that I just used. So I'll go up one level. And I'm going to look, and here I have a, in, in advance, I created a color anaglyph folder. So I'm going to open that. And I'm happy with the name that I've got. So I'm just going to save it. And now I've saved that. So for beginners, 
that is the beauty of Stereo Photo Maker. You've got a way to auto align your pictures. And again, the whole purpose here is to make it as easy as possible for viewing. Uh, I'll go back to side by side. Let's say you're one of those people that uh, likes to cross eye view. Not a problem. If you look uh, on this toolbar here, this icon here, let's see. You notice it says swap left, right. So for those of you that can cross eye view, I'm going to click on it. Now it's uh, swapped it. The left is on the right, the right is on the left. And if you were to click on file, save stereo image, that would be saving it as a side by side pair, but cross eyed. I'm not going to do it, but I wanted to show you that it's possible. Um, another nice feature is uh, you can crop in stereo. And my preferred method for cropping is I put it in anaglyph mode. And let's say I just wanted to make this a tighter picture. So I've got the anaglyph. You can click on, this is the cropping tool here. And normally if you hold over it, it'll tell you free cropping. And free cropping means uh, you're not limited to, you know, you can make it uh, a square, you can make it a rectangle, you can make it any size you want. So let's say I wanted to crop it to a horizontal format about like that. You create that box, click in the middle. I can go back to full size or back to anaglyph. And now I've got a cropped version of it. Uh, let's say I didn't like that cropping. Go back to side by side. There's an undo button here. You can undo and I could start over. And let's say I wanted to crop it. Oh wait, let me go to anaglyph, start over here. And a crop. Say so I wanted a, uh, you know, just a center section. You know, you got all those possibilities. I can undo it, and you can save it again any way you want. So uh, that's it. Uh, let's say for some reason, either with your twin camera or even with uh, doing a side by side pair. Sometimes you might have a slight exposure difference or maybe a color temperature difference between the two. If you go to adjust and this thing that says auto color adjustment, uh, you'll notice it says left ref, light right ref. Uh, let's say the exposure on the left you thought was a little better than on the right. If you clicked on that, in this case, you're not gonna really see any difference, but it could be subtle, but it'll then match them. And that can be very handy if you've got a slight exposure or a color temperature difference between the two pictures. So uh, those are basically some of the main features of uh, Stereo Photo Maker for beginners. Uh, the last thing I'll mention is, let's say you've got a lot of images to do at once. You can do everything I just did automatically uh, as a batch using a feature here called multi-conversion. And in this case, again, you go to the uh, file, or sorry, yeah, file and go down to multi-conversion and you tell it uh, where you want to look in for, let's say your left images. So let's say I've got all these lefts in one folder. And here I've just got four of them. And so that's the left folder. And these are uh, independent left rights. So it's telling you what is the input file type. So in this case, it's independent. So I had to click on that and then it says, okay, where's the right images? So now I have to browse over here to where the right images are. Here's my list of folders that I had, and here's the right. So I say, okay. So now that's the right folder. I want to output them as side-by-side -side pairs, JPEGs, and that's my choices here. 
but you could do TIFFs, GIFs, MPOs. I'm going to click on Auto Align and Auto Crop. And again, for beginners, I just suggest take my word for it, just use those. And then you pick the browse to the folder where you want to save them. In this case, I'm going to put them back in the uh, in the aligned uh, aligned pairs folder. So then I double check where are my lefts. Here they are in the left folder. The input file is independent left right, and I've picked the right image folder. I'm outputting side by side JPEGs. Oh, there's also an option here. You can pick the image quality. 99 is the highest, so I always go for that. Uh, I've got auto alignment, auto cropping, and I've chosen the folder where I'm going to save them. And then I want to convert all four files, but there could just as easily be 100. You say convert all files, and then it tells you verbally what it's going to do. I'm going to convert the four selected files, what folder it's going to save to. Do you want to start? You say yes. And what you just saw it do on one pair, it's now doing that, going to go through you know, four pairs and do that. But in this case, I already did one. So I'm going to, I'll just overwrite it and let it continue to do those four. And again, this is uh, as fast as the speed of your computer, the faster the computer, the faster it'll do this. And when I'm doing, let's say at the end of the day, I've got a whole bunch. Uh, I just let it go through these uh, and walk away or do something else while it's doing it. But uh, I'll just, since it's not going to take very long, I'll wait to show you the finish. And we're almost done. Okay, so that's done. I'll exit. Just have a look. I can go file, open a stereo image, and I'm going to go to that folder, the Align Pairs folder, and there are the four images that we just lined up. So that's the basics, Stereo Photo Maker for beginners. And if there are any questions, we're going to have uh, a live Q&A when, when we're done here. So thank you for listening. And I hope you beginners have learned a little about getting started with Stereo Photo Maker. Huzzah. Huzzah. Hello, David, you're back and also- Okay, hi things. everybody. <laughs> Wait, maybe I'll uh, take off my glasses. Great. Yeah. One so, second. There was, so there was a lot of a lot uh, going on on the YouTube chat and then also on the other side, there were some questions about running it on the Mac, which we we'll can answer in the chat because that's not really a, uh, it's more a little bit more advanced than what you're talking about. So if anybody has any questions about the, uh, about the basic things, if you want to put it in the chat or if you want to click to raise your hand on the bottom, if you go down to reactions and click raise hand. I guess we have we have a couple like a minute or two maybe so we keep on track. <laughs> yeah, they, they haven't left much time for Q and A, yeah. uh, but I, I will mention. Uh, look for me. I I, I can't say when, but uh, I will try to be in the uh, uh, gather town at different times. And I've used my full name, David Starkman. So if you see me and you want to ask some questions about Stereo Photo Maker, uh, feel free to come up to me in uh, Gather Town. I, I can talk to you then. And uh, right now, I, uh, I don't know if you could, if Dave or one of you could help me on any questions people we, have written. We really are, we really are so blessed to have this stereo photo maker. And this is just this amazing, when I was prepping stuff, I needed to process, I needed to crop a whole group of images. And I went to multi-conversion. I thought I had to write something down, but it actually remembers your last crop and sticks it in. So you can apply that crop to everything. So it's like, 
if you think it can do it, Masuji's probably done it in there, which is why there's so many features. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, this is just for beginners. There's a million features. I and I only do the beginner one because they're so like what you just said. I've never done that. I've never applied a crop to a batch, you know, to in a multi conversion. Uh, but uh, Pascal's got a got a question. Is it possible to adjust the stereo window in parallel view or only an anaglyph like you showed? Oh, no, no. You can do it in parallel. Uh, and in fact, you can you can once you've done your auto alignment, if you want to tweak the window a little bit, if you're looking at it parallel, uh, you can use the right and left arrows and it will uh, adjust the window while you're looking at it. And I, you know, I look at it with my uh, my little viewer like this uh, while I'm adjusting it. Uh, I only use I found the anaglyph for me if I want to do cropping, that it was easier to use the crop tool in anaglyph than to do it side by side. You can do it in both, uh, but I just prefer doing it in anaglyph and then going back to side by side. But no, you could do it. You could crop in side by side just as easily. Yeah, I think yeah, for alignment too, you can you can always adjust the window in most most every view in there. So a lot of times you'd use the the auto alignment and then you would adjust your window probably. Right? Yeah, you can uh, once you've auto aligned it. Uh, instead of going back to the easy adjustment, if it's just a, a little bit of horizontal that you want to play with, uh, you can put it in anaglyph mode and do it using left right arrows, or you could do it side by side. Uh, you can even do it over under. I didn't show that format, but <laughs> for those of you with one of those, uh, I forgot the name of it, but the viewer for an over under pair, you can do that. <laughs> and then if you hold or, down the shift, I guess this is advanced, but if you hold down shift yeah. and do right and left, it does a tiny little increment. Yeah. And there's a, uh, and also for those of you with a, a 3D monitor, it's got the uh, interlaced view, uh, which is possible. So, uh, yeah, Linda's saying she prefers to crop in side by side. I prefer to crop in interlaced. So, everybody finds yeah. a way to, to use it. Um, yeah, everybody's got their preference on how they want to be viewing it. Um, and it just maybe depends what kind of monitor. And if you're a cross eye free viewer, you're welcome to do it that way. You know, uh, I, I like, I mean, I can preview, but I, I like using a little viewer like this. <laughs> Yeah. So any more questions, put them in the chat. Uh, these are really fun to do in a, in a live convention because with kind of unlimited questions, someone might see something that you did and say, like, with, with again, it's more advanced, but there's this multi-conversion and then there's a multi, like a batch processing and someone raised yeah. their hand and said, oh, by the way, turn that thing on and it'll speed up your time. Like, oh, you're always, we're always learning new things about this. Yeah. But, oh, but and is, again, I'll mention there, uh, I'll repeat again on the, uh, the Stereo Photo Maker website, there are uh, several different tutorials you can click on. There's also one on using the Stereo Clone Tool, which is a more advanced feature. But uh, if you have a little object on the left, uh, uh, a flash bubble that you don't want, uh, you can crop, you can clone in depth at the right depth uh, is, is a possibility. And there's instructions for that. And there's also, uh, instructions for uh, making stereo cards. There's a template for uh, doing prints uh, in Stereo Photo Maker. But again, that's all for more other workshops. <laughs> oh, and here's all the, here's the helpful little, uh, little tips yeah. on the yeah. screen. So if you go to that okay. page, yeah. Yeah. And you can see there's, if you go farther down, I think uh, there's, Somewhere there's something about, oh yeah, the clone tool instructions are there. Uh, and there's also one on uh, stereo cards by David Kuntz. Right. Cool, so maybe we'll, maybe we'll wrap it up. And um, again, if yeah. you have any, okay. any questions. We'll go on to doc, Dr. T and doing 3D close-ups. All right, Take it around. another round of applause for, uh, for David Starkman for everything he's done for stereo and for this presentation as it is the approach. And I, I want to add one more thing to Rick Shomsky, who edited that uh, 
that workshop and made it way better than it was live. <laughs> so thank you, Rick. So back to Rick, who's muted at, this, at the moment. He's unmuting. You're very welcome, David. Uh, George is the next one up. Does George have... Uh, Oh, so it looks like you, you got, got muted, Rick. What? I'm getting... uh, Rick is okay. okay Rick I'm back. back. I just wanted to make sure George had uh, screen sharing available. Mm -hmm. All right, George Themelis is going to do a workshop how to take close ups in 3D. George is also known to the community as Dr. T. He discovered stereo photography with a stereo realist and joined NSA in 1988, so he's a longtime member. In 1997, he co-founded the Ohio Stereo Photographic Society in Cleveland. George has enjoyed writing tutorials as the editor of the OSPS, that's the Ohio Club, newsletter Stereogram for 22 years, and is the newly appointed editor of the International Stereoscopic Union Stereoscopy Magazine. He deals with stereo equipment and supplies for stereo photography at Dr. T 3D, that's drt3d.com and eBay. He also takes plenty of stereo pictures. His favorite subjects are nature, people, and travel. His equipment includes a Fuji W3, a Panasonic 3D1, a Panasonic 3D lens, and a variety of twin cameras. So, George has probably used more equipment than anybody else I know. So that's why he's such an expert on so many different kinds of equipment. So I'll let George share his screen and begin. Thank you. Okay, does everything look okay? Yeah, it looks good. Greetings from Cleveland, it's a hot and humid day. My challenge is to summarize 20 years of uh, close-ups in 20 minutes. Uh, I, you should use your 3D glasses and you can practice right now uh, looking at this picture, which is actually a close up of me, self portrait on a mirror with one of my uh, 3D, equipment, 3D equipment for close ups. I will define what a close up is. I will tell you about the challenges of taking close ups in 2D and 3D. And I will discuss the different equipment and techniques that I have personally used to take close-ups. Um, it's easier for me to tell you what's not a close-up. And here on the left, you have a picture that shows uh, a distant scene. And that's definitely not a close-up. It's called normal or distant 3D photograph. Uh, traditionally from realist photography, we define this when the object is from seven feet to infinity. When you start getting closer than seven feet, which is about two meters, then you enter into the realm of close-ups. It's better instead of distances to use the magnification or the size of your object, which is the same thing. So the close-up start at the magnification of one over 60 when you have an object that's about 60 inches tall. And then you keep increasing the magnification until you get in the area of the macro. Macro is traditionally defined at the magnification of one to one, which means your subject is about 24 millimeters tall. So if you're photographing something smaller than an inch, you're doing macro. My presentation will cover this area of the close-up. Right in the middle, we have the tight portrait, something that I like to shoot in 3D. It has a magnification of one over 10. Now, in 2D, the challenge is how to achieve the magnification. In 3D, the challenge is how to keep the stereoscopic deviation under control. To increase the magnification, you see that's a focal length over distance. You can either increase the focal length or what most people do, they reduce the distance or they get close. That's why it's called a close up. But when you get closer, we have a problem with the deviation. Deviation is the stereo base, which is the distance of your lenses divided by the distance to the subject. As you get closer, this tends to get big and you have a problem. And the way to solve the problem is to reduce your stereo base. That's your challenge in 3D close-up photography. I have summarized here seven methods that you can do that. And I'm going to describe each one in detail. 
Uh, I have a little schematic, the range of stereobases and whether this method is good for a low magnification or a high magnification close up. Method number one is the mother of all <laughs> stereo methods is using one camera and shift is the easiest and least expensive method because everybody has one camera, which can just be your, your phone. It, it's always been an option. And today with digital photography and software alignment that David showed you, it's even easier to do. So basically you take a picture, you shift the camera and you take another picture. You can take anything from macro to hyper stereos. Uh, one drawback though of this method is that nothing should move between the two pictures. Now, given this flexibility, you need a guideline. Where, where do you start? How much do you shift? Well, here's my guideline to you. I use the, uh, take measure the distance to the nearest object and divide by 20. One twentieth of the distance to the nearest object is a good starting point. Where did I get that? Well, here, I, um, this, it turns out the stereoscopic deviation on a, in a close-up depends on three factors, two of which depend on your subject, the magnification and the thickness or the depth range. The third variable, it's the, this ratio of stereo base over distance that you can control. Now, there are two bad things that can happen. Over here, if this ratio is too large, if it's one tenth, 10% 10 or more, you are looking for trouble you're really a lot of things can go wrong. You have excessive deviation. On the other extreme, if this ratio is too small, your stereo pair will look uh, flat. So right in between those values, one over 20, from my personal experience, is a good starting point for close-ups. Now, if your subject is not very deep or if you don't mind a lot of deviation, you can move to the right. If you are projecting images on a big screen and you want to be conservative, then you stay on the left. Let's see a few stereo pairs with a single camera. This is a typical tabletop. Tabletop means that you put a few things, usually at the top of a table, and you take a picture. Well, you have full control, nothing is moving. So a single camera is the perfect tool to take a stereo pair. There's no reason to use a stereo camera. So uh, construct your tabletop, measure the distance, divide by 20, shift the camera, and that's a good starting point. Many times the iPhone turns out to be the best stereo camera I have with me. First, because I always carry it with me. And second, like in this situation, that's a display in the Cleveland Museum of Natural History behind glass. If you move back, you get reflections. The glass enclosure is curved, so you need a small lens and you flash the phone on the glass and you're so close that you only need a few millimeters of shift and there you have your stereo pair. You can even use the Fuji. There's something called the advanced 3D mode and I, I encourage you to check it out if you don't know what it is. You can record anything from hyper stereos to macro using this technique. Let's move to uh, method number two. You can use a standard stereo camera for close-ups. What's a standard stereo camera? Any system that has a spacing of the lenses between 60 and 75 millimeters. You can use it for close-ups, but I give you two recommendations. I strongly advise you first to block the background and second, instead of coming closer, stay back and zoom in. It's the distance that does the damage. And one typical beginner error is to come too close to your subject. And here's my friend, Ursula. Occasionally I see her coming uncomfortably close to something with her stereo camera. And then of course, as the good 3D teacher that I am, I have to scream and say with my, using my Greek voice, no, what are you doing? So hopefully she will learn. Well, let me say this, the background is the enemy of the close-ups. This applies to the entire presentation today. A few years ago, I attended a presentation of a 2D photography on bird photography. And he said, the background can make or break one of my pictures. And I was thinking, if that's true in 2D photography, it's a hundred times more true in 3D photography because the background not only would distract from your object, also it carries the excessive stereoscopic deviation. So how do you eliminate the background? 
Well, here are some ideas. You can use a physical barrier. That can be a wall. It can be a piece of cardboard, a piece of cloth. Sometimes I hold things. These are 3D pictures, by the way. I hold things on my hands that blocks the background and gives me a scale of how small the item is. You can use a featureless background. Occasionally, when I shoot flowers on trees, I go low perspective and I shoot with the sky as the background. If it's featureless, it doesn't exist. You can throw the background out of focus if you're using long lenses. You can use a flash to darken the background. And if everything fails, <laughs> then you have digital manipulation to the rescue. And for me, that's the last resort. For some people, it's the first. For me, it's the last. I'm just gonna show you two pictures. This is our, our esteemed NSA vice president. And she is also the president of the Ohio Stereo Club. I photographed this portrait in a meeting and I, in textbook fashion, I stood in the back, I zoomed in, and the wall is blocking the background. This is a model I photographed at PSA. They were using LED lights, so the background was there. I couldn't avoid it in the photo shoot, so I eliminated it digitally. I diffused it and made it dark. Let's move to method number three. If you enjoy close-ups, you should consider investing in a close-up 3D camera. What is that? That's a camera system with a spacing of the lenses between 20 and 40 millimeters. In the film era, we had the Nimslo, we had the rare ISO duplex Italian camera, the macro realist, and this camera, the Horseman 3D. Now, today in digital, I think the Panasonic Lumix 3D1 has taken the place of the Horseman. And then you have a plethora of 3D video cameras, phone cameras that have really short spacing of the lenses. And these systems are well suited for close-ups. I'm only gonna highlight the Panasonic, which is one of my favorite cameras. It's already 10 years old. It's, you cannot find it anymore. Demand and supply have made it hard to find and expensive, but I do have one for sale, by the way. Anyway, um, a, lot, a lot of advantages. You can study this table later. Let me address this question. If you have a camera with a certain distance between the lenses, how close can you get to your subject for a good close-up? Well, reverse math here. The answer is 20 times the stereo base. So the stereo base over distance would be the one over 20 ratio I recommend. For this particular camera, 30 millimeters is the stereo base times 20, you have 0.6 meters or 24 inches. Well, it turns out that this is approximately the distance of your extended hand. So here's the Lumix and the way I use it, I hold it in my face and I extend my hand until I touch my subject, and then I know I'm at a good, good distance and I take the picture. And as a matter of fact, you realize that if you like selfies, <laughs> the Lumix at the extended hand is the perfect camera for 3D selfies, while the Fuji is not. Look what happens if you try to take a selfie with the Fuji. I think we, you see here the effects of excessive stereoscopic deviation, which is not very pleasant. Now I can spend the rest of my presentation showing you pictures from the Lumix, but I have to move on. I'm just gonna mention the most exciting application here. I use the Panasonic to take underwater pictures. Uh, I bought a $10 underwater case five years ago from China and it worked great. I wish I had bought all the case, a hundred of them because I can't find them anymore. I only have two left for me. And there are other tools. This one, I documented through, the, through two months time, the development of a wasp nest close to my house. And I used the Sony TD10, which is a 3D video camera with a stereo base of 20 millimeters. And, and then I grabbed, because I'm only interested, mainly interested in 3D still photography, I grabbed the frame out of the video and here it is. Okay, we are up to method number four. People have made attachments that you can put in front of the Fuji camera to reduce the spacing. Uh, this can be done with mirrors or prisms. Cyclopital made one of those. It's hard to find today. And there's a guy in Germany that actually makes something similar that maybe you can buy. I have used this for a little bit. I took this picture of my wife. And then I have this one picture was taken, recorded on film with an RBT macro attachment. That's, that's Dale Ying's daughter. 
It's a beautiful picture. You might say, well, it's a little bit flat. Look at the ratio, it's one over 40. It's basically the limit I told you, if you go below that, it's a little bit flat. But if you project this in a big screen or if you start moving back, you get a little bit of stretch and it looks very nice. Okay, method number five, you use a, a 2D camera and a 3D lens. Now what's a 3D lens? A 3D lens is a lens that has two lenses within. So it records a stereo pair. The stereo pair, the two pictures share the same film or sensor area. So immediately you see a disadvantage that you lose half the resolution since the two pictures share one area. But you don't have to worry about synchronization because you only use one shutter. You can use flash. The system is compact. There's so many benefits to this. And there are a little few choices. There are people making these like our own Octay. I'm only going to discuss the Panasonic 3D lens. This lens was introduced about nine or 10 years ago. It's not made anymore, but you can find it used. And of course I have one for sale. Uh, this lens attaches to micro four-third cameras made by Panasonic and Olympus. It has two lenses, 10 millimeters apart, apart, but everything is fixed, including the focus. The focus is at about one meter. If you divide the lens spacing 10 millimeters by the focus distance, you get the ratio of one over 100. That's extremely weak depth. You're not going to be happy with this lens for general photography. However, this is great for close-ups, but it needs to be made to focus closer. Well, how do you do that? Here we're doing basic 2D photography. There are two fundamental ways to make a lens focus closer. One is to move it away from the camera body. And people found that if you remove the back of the lens, you can insert little washers and that will push it a little bit away from the camera. And I'm talking about half millimeter to two and a half millimeters. That's all the range you need to make this lens focus on a wide range of distances. The other way is to use close-up lenses in front of the lens. Then the lens will focus closer. Through my use of this lens, I started with close-up lenses, then I used extension, and now I'm using a combination of the two. Before I show you my setup, I want to tell you about the close-up lenses. They're characterized by the strength, and you have simple lenses that usually come in sets of three, one, two, and four. And then you have achromatic lenses that are heavier, more expensive, and they have values like three, five, and 10. For anything higher than plus one strength, I recommend that you use an achromatic lens. And you can stack them up, and when you stack them up, the, the powers are adding up. So this is my current setup. I have my Panasonic camera. I have a lens that I modified with the minimum extension that's acceptable for me, which is half a millimeter. This extension makes the lens focus instead of one meter at one third of a meter, about 12 inches from the camera. And then I have this attachment, which are available for sale. The lens doesn't have threads, so this attachment fits with friction, gives you threads that you can attach close-up lenses, and also gives you a pointer that aids the focusing. So I found that without any close-up lens, my focus is at the end of my focusing rod. And then if I collapse it one section at a time, this corresponds to specific uh, close-up lenses. If I collapse it completely down here, I can use my plus 10 lens. So I get five magnification from four close-up lenses. Now, if you try the system, to, uh, don't, I don't want you to get confused. So it's better to just have three choices. No lens, low magnification, plus three, medium magnification, plus 10 high magnification. Let me show you a few pictures I've taken with this lens. This is from the same development of the wasp nest at the early stages. Here I was at a public park during the NSA convention in Utah. So I walk around with my Panasonic camera and lens and I just take pictures of all the small subjects I find interesting. And when I get bored at home, I started throwing things in the water. <laughs> and I photographed their splashing. Now I have to tell you that what froze the water here is not the shutter speed of the camera, but it's the use of flash. And this brings me to the next topic. 100% of my pictures with this lens, I've used the flash because it freezes the motion, it darkens the background. And by positioning the flash in different ways, you get better contrast 
shadows, textures, more drama into your picture. You can study this later. I've experimented and I found that I like this twin head flash. So I have two heads. I can put one behind the subject, both to the side, one side and one front. I have a lot of options here. This picture I took, it's an orchid at the Cleveland Botanical Gardens. I was in a well-lit room and I've done no Photoshop. This is how the picture came out of the camera. The background has completely eliminated by the flash. Well, there's a way to do that. If you use your camera or flash in auto mode, the camera will try to balance the flash and ambient light. I don't want that. I want to eliminate it. So I use both the flash and the camera on manual mode. I set the smallest aperture, but this lens doesn't have an option. The faster shutter speed that the camera would synchronize with flash. For some older cameras, this is one over 100, but for my Panasonic GX8, it's one over 600, and that's the speed I use. And then I use the smallest ISO value, one over 100 usually. And then after I set the camera like this, and these settings will eliminate any ambient light, I adjust the intensity of the flash manually and the position to get a good exposure. I have two more pictures. This is our hero, Brian May. I was at the 2015 NSA conventional happy hour. So Brian was sitting there happily eating and I approached and I said, can I take a picture of you? And he said, yeah, sure. So I came 12 inches from his face. That's a little bit close. And boom, I fired my twin flash. And, I, and this is what came out. It looks like a studio. So it's hard to believe that it's in the middle of a busy room. And that's the low side of the magnification with this lens. It's one over 10. The next picture is my own eye photograph in the mirror. And here's magnifications in one to one. Those two extremes. So what you can do with this lens. Let me move on to method number six. Here we have uh, two cameras and a semi-transparent mirror, also known as a beam splitter. One camera sees through the mirror and one camera reflects from the mirror and one camera is stationary and the other can move. If you align the two cameras, you have zero stereo base. As you start moving the cameras away, you get an increasing stereo base and there's a commercial version of this idea called the macro box that has adjustable stereo base from zero to 50 millimeters. When I got started in stereo, photo, stereo photography digitally, I contacted Kova Necker in the Netherlands and he supplied me with two Panasonic TZ10 cameras and a macro box. And all of a sudden I was in macro heaven because there was no Panasonic 3D camera or lens, there was nothing else. All of a sudden with this macro box, I could take close-ups of my cat and then I can shoot birds or inside a nest. And one of the things I regret is that I sold the system. <laughs> I don't know, I thought I was upgrading. That was one of the biggest mistake I made. I sold the cameras in the micro box, but you can obtain them. The, the concern is the synchronization of the two cameras and if you can use flash with them or not. And now, I mean, the last technique using twin cameras and long lenses has been an interest and some would say an obsession of me for the last two years. This is different. Here, instead of coming closer and reducing the stereo base, you actually stay far away and you increase the stereo base. To put it in a schematic, all the methods I described so far, you get close, you use a small stereo base. I told you you can use a stereo camera standard. Now I'm here, number three, I, as long as you maintain the same magnification, as you go back, you zoom in, you maintain the same subject. And as you go back, you increase the stereo base proportionally. So you have the same stereoscopic deviation. Those pictures look surprisingly similar. You might not be able to tell the difference, assuming that the background is blocked. That's a huge assumption. If you decide to play with the two cameras and no lenses, in addition to synchronization, which is always an issue when you use two cameras, you have to worry about alignment because everything is magnified. Every misalignment is highly magnified. So you have the vertical alignment and the horizontal alignment. You need to converge your, subs, your cameras to the subject or you're gonna lose a lot of image area. I played with different mounting methods. At first I had my camera side by side. 
But soon I realized that if I put them bottom to bottom, I was able to align them easier. And eventually I put them top to top and this is what I'm doing now. And I have them spaced so I can see through the viewfinders. So I'm able to compose my picture. I see it in 3D. I can correct any alignment visually. I can convert them and set the stereo window visually. This system has been working very well for me. This is a stereo pair with the camera side by side. I use my Panasonic cameras here. And this is a close up with a long focal length. In both cameras, you see how the background has been diffused. So it's out of the picture because of the use of the long focal length lenses. Let me show you the anatomy of this shot. That's not how the shot looks when it was taken. It looks like the one on the left here. Originally, the focal length of the lens, 160 millimeters, but because you have a small sensor, there's something called the crop ratio. So you get, you get an effective focal length of 480, but when I crop and I magnify three more times, the effective focal length is 1,500 millimeters. This is the focal length of telescopes. It's like I'm using two telescopes, only two meters from my subject, converging into my subject to achieve a close up with a magnification of one over two. And another benefit I discovered is it's not only the close up, but sometimes the foreground is also thrown out of focus. In this case, there was a linked fence. Right in front of my lens, there is a fence. Any other camera system, it will be unusable. You will see the fence in the picture. But because it's so close, it has been diffused. You can see a little bit of a dark band, but it's like it's not there anymore. Both the foreground and the background have disappeared. This is my last stereo pair. And just to show you how useful this system is, if you cannot get close to your subject, really you don't have many choices. This is the setup how this picture was taken. I'm at a train station at the Cuyahoga National Park. That's as close as I can get to this nest. I cannot bring a ladder and climb up. I don't think they let me do that. Anyway, this concludes my presentation. I would like to summarize what we discussed. Uh, Close-ups can be very effective in 3D. There is a, a 2D challenge and a 3D challenge, how to achieve magnification, how to control the deviation. I gave you a recommendation. Stereo base over distance should be about one over 20 as a starting point. I discussed seven methods and I know there are more and people have used more, but these are seven important methods that I've used myself. If you're a beginner, the obvious place to start is with a single camera and a shift, if you haven't done this already, or you can take close-ups portraits with a stereo camera and try to stay back and zoom in. If you like close-ups, consider getting this Panasonic 3D1, which is the perfect close-up still camera. And if you want to invest a little money for the Panasonic 3D lens, you can cover a lot of subjects easily with this lens. That's the basic recommendations. And then you have, I guess the sky's the limit from there. So that's the end of my presentation. I'm going to uh, stop sharing the screen now and I don't know if we have any time for uh, questions. Excellent, George. Thanks. Very, very good presentation. I think we do have time for a couple questions. If we, if you wanna put them in the chat or if you wanna press the raise hand button, we can try to call upon you. I know there was a lot of discussion about, um, about mirror rigs and mm -hmm. taking cha-chas. So the mirror rigs will allow you to get a close-up because they can, uh, they can use one lens and then, and then get close with that mirror. A lot of thank yous on the chat, George. They <laughs> appreciated it very much. Okay, I will be around. If you have any questions, you can email me. I also have a table at the trade show. I'm not very active, but you can always reach me by email. Yep. So if in Gather Town, if you go into Gather, do you plan to go into Gather Town at all, George? Maybe I'll After, try. <laughs> yeah, well, so if you see George, then feel free to come up to him in Gather Town and find him. Mm -hmm.
Okay. Well, oh, let me check the YouTube. You can also download the notes and study them. And of course, you can play back the video at any time. Yeah, that is a good point. Um, YouTube chat is really just... Uh, yeah, I see the question Gordon is asking to take the same subject using the different tools. I could try it one day. I haven't done it. Now, some of those methods are more suitable for low magnification, some of them higher, but somewhere in the middle, you could use every rig to try the same subjects. I have done a challenge where I took one close with the Panasonic 3D1 and then far back with my twin rigs. And I asked people, it was a portrait. I said, well, which one is which? Can you tell? Well, some people could tell, but it's, it's not really very easy. There is a slight difference in perspective, like the size of the ears compared to the nose, because there are different depth, depth distances. They show difference in perspective. But it's not very easy to see. They're very similar. OK, and we have a question from, uh, from Peter Bahuth. Uh, if you want to, you should be able to unmute and ask your question. Hi, George. Thank you for that. Um, you talked about the horseman, and you can get close-up lenses for that. But you're looking through a view a viewfinder rather than through the lenses. So how do you how do you make sure your focus is right when you're using? Well, the same the same way I do with the 3D lens and the little antenna. When I was using the horseman, I had a measuring tape. Okay. I yeah. was actually measuring, I knew for where the close-up lens would focus. You can calculate that. And then I was using a focusing aid. Even with the digital cameras, in theory, you can see if you are in focus, but with this lens, it has a small aperture. Everything looks sharp. This focusing rod is very useful for me. It guarantees that I'm at the right spot. Otherwise, a guesswork. And I did the same for the horseman. Did you make the focusing rod? I have I have a, a blog and I just I saw a picture. Yeah, I, it was just a measuring tape for the horseman. Okay. Marked marked at different places depending on the close-up lens I used. Okay. Is there a place I could go to figure out that kind of measuring rod? Yeah. Um, I can put some information about, are you interested in the horseman or the- uh, I have the horseman, right? And I have the lenses and I'm talking okay. about- the, this, is, uh, this is a very rare camera. I use it towards the end of my film era. Yeah. I sold it when I switched the- film, camera. so- It's a great camera. <laughs> yeah, love it. I'll okay. Contact me and I'll give you the link over my blog. Okay, thank you. Question if the distance is measured from the lens of the film plane. When in theory is the film plane, but if you're talking about 12 inches, the difference between the film and the lens is really small, so it's not critical. Only when you get really, really close, then uh, focusing is more critical and the distances are a little bit more important. Uh, I was just gonna type in the chat on the YouTube, people are mentioning hyper stereos. So the, hyper? The what you talked about, yeah. which is, did you wanna speak to that real quick? Well, that, would, that would be my topic on the next <laughs> year. So, but I've done workshops in hyper stairs with single camera twin. It's a totally different, you know, approach, but you know, a different challenge really. Yeah, just to open that world up to people as uh, well. And I want to say that stereoscopy, I, you mentioned that I am the editor of the ISU stereoscopy. The next issue I'm, I'm finishing now is on hyper stereo. So there are articles about techniques, a lot of pictures, and you are all invited to submit your hyper stereos to me and see them published in stereoscopy. And there will be more, and I have so much material, there will be at least two, maybe three issues on hyper stereos. Great, and stereoscopy, I'll put the link in the chat, but stereoscopy is the uh, publication of the ISU mm -hmm. International, and you get stereoscopy with your ISU membership. All right, great. So why don't we, maybe we'll just wrap this up. Uh, and so again, go to Gather Town if you want. Uh, maybe people will be there and you can try to chat. And we have a, uh, again, George's, George and David both have information on the workshops tab. So you can go and uh, get further information about the, uh, the slides. But thanks everyone. See you in the next session in about 20 minutes. 
Uh, yes, you do need to exit the Zoom and start again. It'll be a different Zoom session.